This is an awesome event and I am extremely honored uh, to present to you today from my home office here in Farmville, Virginia. I'm about two hours north of Raleigh. And um, back when I used to fly, I often flew out of RDU. So very familiar with that area, at least around the airport there. Um, I want to share with you a little bit today about Azure DevOps and SQL Server uh, Integration Services or SSIS. Just a brief introduction, um, more time than I should give myself. But if you want to know a lot, uh, a lot, if you want to know more, <laughs> there's, uh, you can just pop into your favorite search engine and type Andy Leonard data. Um, I've, I've written some books. I am co-host, co-host, not host, co-host of a podcast, trying to mix host and pod together there, uh, data-driven and a new podcast that isn't even on the list. It's that new. It's called Impact Quantum, and we talk about quantum computing. My co-host, Frank Lavinia, uh, who works for, for Microsoft, he and I chat about this. So again, Andy Leonard data, if you want to know more about that, or if you're having trouble falling asleep at night. So that was the introduction. I want to do just a brief history of um, CICD, Continuous Integration, Continuous Deployment. And then we're going to look at source control by example. And again, using um, SQL Server Integration Services, it's more of a business intelligence topic than a software development topic. But the truth is, uh, working with SSIS uh, to do ETL or data engineering or data integration, it is software development. It's a component that plugs right into Visual Studio from Microsoft, and um, it, you know that's that's a, a great big clue. And I've been fascinated with this topic. Uh, for at least 13 years. Um, really, it's been more than that. I was an MCSD back before .NET came out. And uh, I, I did most of my work in Visual Basic. I did um, some um, early intranet work with, um, with InterDev. Anybody remember Microsoft InterDev? I started typing HTML in, uh, in Notepad. But back when I made the jump into data in the early 2000s, um, I had just gotten into test-driven development with Visual Basic. I know I was a little behind in that, but fascinating stuff. And I was practicing it. When I first heard about it, it was called fail-first development. And that was perfect for me because I failed all the time. And I kept failing until I got it to work. Um, this is some demo architecture. It's actually a slide from a presentation I did at the PASS Summit in Denver in 2007. It was my first one, and you can see my PowerShell skills haven't improved at all. But back then, I actually took two laptops and a router with me, so I'd have a beefy enough um, presentation machine and a an, uh, kind of a demo machine that I remoted into. Um, yeah, that's Andy the the weird. But um, this was Team Foundation Server, which was an early predecessor to um, uh, to the um, uh, what we now have is Azure DevOps. So it kind of migrated to the cloud as tfs.visualstudio.com and then it became Azure DevOps. Um, when you start applying this to, uh, to SSIS, we want to merge the software frequently. Um, that's continuous integration. Unfortunately, SSIS is actually XML. And because of the way XML works and the way that, um, that merging in most continuous integration uh, engines work, um, it doesn't work so well. You can run into some issues. And there's other tools out there that can help you overcome those issues, but it's really, um, it's really hard to do a text-based merge with XML. And the short answer for why is that, that the actual text can move around inside of the file and still represent the same object. Um, things being in the same place. So you can get a lot of false negatives where it says, hey, this is, you know, this doesn't match. And in truth, it does. It just needs to be rationalized so you can do a good, um, a good comparison on it. Continuous delivery is all about de deploying software frequently. And I said back in the day that SSIS is uh, software development. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to do a walkthrough here. I'm just going to show you pictures. The pictures are from Azure DevOps, and as with all things Microsoft Azure, uh, the, I can guarantee you some of the slides are out of date. I'd be happy to send you the deck 
and you can walk through this yourself. Nothing is so out of date that it um, it has changed so much that you won't be able to figure out where things are. That's that's a fact. But things change in Microsoft Azure daily. So we're going to look at applying source control. And we would do this in uh, Azure DevOps by creating, um, first you'd create an organization. And my organization is uh, Enterprise Data and Analytics or uh, ENT DNA. And we created a, you know, a new project up in uh, in Azure DevOps, <clears throat> and you can sign up for uh, for Azure DevOps. Usually, they've got some kind of free deal going on. I'm almost positive that they still offer teams of up to five uh, individuals, five developers, free uh, use of Azure DevOps. Um, but there's a there's a lot in here, and there's a lot going on in Microsoft about Azure DevOps versus GitHub. And I don't know that they've got that figured out. Uh, as of October 2020 when we're talking about this. But you can always start free. You sign up and create your account. You create your um, organization. Mine is ENTDNA. And after that, you create a new project. Um, you can set those projects up as publicly visible or maintain them as private. Um, you can see down here, I'm using, um, I'm using Team Foundation version control. And I'm going to speak some to that a little bit later. Not much later, <laughs> but after you've created uh, a new project, uh, you can begin then to, to work with it. And at, here's that. Here's my slide I was I was referring to about talking about this, uh, using this later. And I get this an awful lot when I talk about this. I hear people say, "But Andy, everyone's using, you know, using Git." And you know, and and my response is right here on the slide. It turns out there are enterprises that have a significant investment in Team Foundation services. And they're looking for ways to continue operating the way that they operate, except they want to lift and shift to the cloud. Um, a lot of people aren't aware that you can do this, that you can move TFS, um, you know, you move your TFS options and leverage all the knowledge that you have already about Team Foundation server um, by putting it uh, into the cloud. But uh, I just wanted to share that. That's why I chose um, that that's the, uh, the the project engine for this entire the rest of the demos in here. Um, after you do that, you need to configure Visual Studio, and that's just clicking Tools Options and then going to Source Control and picking the um, the engine that you want to use. And there's uh, uh, Get in there, and there's Team Foundation Server. After you get that selected, you need to manage connections and then connect to a project. And there's a lot of similarity here between setting up GET and TFS, but the workflow is actually different. So you do things in a different order when you do this with GET. I use both. I mostly use, um, use GET internally for the projects that we maintain and the code we maintain. But we've helped organizations um, you know, move into the cloud um, with source control. We've helped them make the shift from uh, TFS to get. I haven't helped anybody yet go the other direction. I'll just say that. I don't anticipate that, but you never know. Um, once you've uh, connected to a, your team project that I just created here, mine is called SSIS Samples, then uh, Team Explorer will look like this in Visual Studio. It looks differently if you're using Git, so just so you know. And my Solution Explorer will then um, will look like this, where I have an, you know, an, an SSIS um, project in here that I built to just test, really to test the source control and the CICD functionality in Azure DevOps. I want you can add that solution to source control and uh, you get a, a, a dialogue that looks similar to this where you're basically acknowledging this is where I want to put this, you know, in this stack uh, out there on TFS. Uh, once you do that, you get these little plus icons. You'll see these. These are going to show up around the artifacts that are ready to be um, ready to be checked in that initial time. These are these little plus symbols mean it's been added, and um, you can think about that as being staged. Although that may not be the best analogy, but it's closed. <laughs> once you do the check in, uh, you want to add a code comment. You can see this is um, gosh, it's almost a year old. Uh, since I, I grabbed that screenshot, but that's accurate. It hasn't changed since then. You do want to do code comments. I mean, it's just future you will thank you. You know, if I went to look at something, I'd checked in 
a year ago, I wouldn't remember it, I can tell you. So the more help I give myself here in these check-in notes, the better. The Visual Studio uses these little blue locks uh, or Azure locks, get it? And um, they will, uh, they, they'll indicate that now you're all checked in and you're all caught up. Um, let's take a look at, um, at a, at a, um, a, a, a uh, checked in repository. This is a, a more mature version of what we're seeing um, on, the, on the screenshots. Now there's just a lot of stuff. You can see I've been checking this one in like an hour ago and there's some uh, other stuff that I checked in very recently. This write a record and succeed, this is the package we're gonna change and trigger uh, changes in our, um, you know, in our code that's checked in. But um, that's, that. this is an Azure uh, DevOps repository. You can see if we, um, if we take a look at the different uh, objects that we have here, we have an overview and then uh, boards and then the files themselves, that's what we're looking at. And we're gonna look at pipelines. We're gonna stay right here in the middle, but there's more artifacts and a lot more to learn and do with, um, with Azure DevOps than we're gonna cover here uh, today. So if you have any questions, by the way, just pop them into the question and answer box. And we've got um, a couple of moderators hanging out with us here who will be happy to stop me and I will, uh, I will answer any questions that you have about this. Um, moving on, we're gonna talk about agents. And I find this part fascinating. <clears throat> I actually started with um, software development in 1975. I was 11, I'm 57, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> and um, so I've been doing this now for for about 45 years. And it's, of course, it started as a hobby when I was 11. I learned Motorola machine code. But I, I absolutely love, you know, the, the kind of these throwbacks to uh, the old days. And we're going to see some of this as we look through both agents and pipelines going forward. And what really fascinates me is the ability to be able to host an agent on a VM running on my laptop in Farmville, Virginia, that's going to interact with the cloud. That's, that's just kind of fascinating. <laughs> um, Self-hosted Windows uh, agents are, you know, this is an article that's been updated several times since um, the 14th of August, 2019. But it's it's a good start. It kind of walks you through how to set up pipelines on self-hosted agents. There's an option to run agents in the cloud. I found that to be really slow the first few times I tried that. Of course, it's been over a year, so they could be whiz bang flying by now. But I mean, it was taking minutes to get um, to get code that was checked in to start doing anything when I was using the uh, agents in the cloud. I pulled down the self-hosted agent on a lark started tinkering around with it and it's like seconds, you know, in seconds we'll see the uh, the agent begin to do stuff. <clears throat> what you have to do to, to get that interaction with your local machine or your enterprise machine in the cloud is you have to set up personal access tokens. And this was one thing with that article that I looked at originally was kind of off about, but the location is under the little person settings here. If you can see that and then there's personal access tokens. And it's moved, um, you know, from where it was, obviously, to this. It may have moved again, but you want to set that up. They're not hard to set up. When you first uh, connect in there, it's going to, you're not going to have any tokens set up, and it's going to prompt you for a new token. And when you do that, if you're going to use self-hosted, you want to use the default agent pool, um, You and, and there's a number of uh, settings that you want to set up. One is you want to do custom defined, you can set this expiration date for way longer than 30 days. I just did that because I think it was the default. Um, and there's some properties that you want to set. Again, all in the documentation, um, but definitely you want to set read and manage on agent pools. And there's just some more uh, down here as you, as you scroll down. When you're done, you click the create button and it'll create your, uh, your new agent. And then you need to go to organization settings here uh, select agent pools and then pick that default agent pool and now you're ready to configure a new agent so you've already set up your personal access token which is going to allow you to communicate securely between your machine uh, and the cloud and that agent that's going to be running locally for you this is what you want to configure 
And I got to tell you, this is one of the coolest uh, pieces of code here I, I've just seen, the coolest little window um, uh, here. And, and for Windows or Mac OS or Linux, you can pick this and set these up. So it doesn't matter which platform you're running on. It's, it's platform agnostic. When you download that agent, it actually remembers the name and it's showing you here in the screenshot, it's actually, this is PowerShell, of course. So you start running PowerShell and it's got the name. You see that right there? It starts here, home, dollar home dot downloads VSTS-agent-win-xc64-2.158-0.zip. So it remembers the agent. It's got that configured for you. You're going to download that. It's going to unzip it for you. That's what this uh, command is going to do. It's going to put it on the C drive in the agent folder. And then you're going to run a config command. And then later you'll run a you'll run run command. And it, but it's all just right here. I just love this integration, right? You click download, you copy this code. There's even a copy link over here that's off the screen. I didn't quite get it in the screenshot. But for each of those PowerShell commands, there's a little copy button. It'll just put it on your clipboard. I chose to run PowerShell from the command prompt because I just did. I, you, you can run it however you'd like. I chose it to, to run the config from here. It first prompts me for that server URL, um, dev.azure.com. And mine is, uh, it's going to be slash then your, your organization name. And so there's mine. And then after that, there's some more stuff. So you can see that server URL is uh, about down. <clears throat> and then, you know, your authentication type, it's going to be personal access token. And then you have to, um, you, when you get that personal access token, um, I didn't, I skipped this back when I, when I was there, but you want to, when it shows you the personal access token, you want to copy that and paste it somewhere because you're never going to be able to get to that again. You'd have to make a new one. Uh, to, you know, to follow along. You're going to need to paste it into here. I usually copy it and put it on um, something like Notepad or Notepad++ or something like that, but you can use anything that'll hold text. Um, just until you get here, and after this, you really don't need the personal access token anymore. Um, you, there's um, agent pools and then an agent name. So here, it's coming, the reason it's asking me about Mustang is I'm using a Lenovo P51S uh, and that was a, the Mustang was a model of an aircraft that had that same P51 designation. So that's where that's coming from. Um, scanning for the capabilities and finally, you know, it asks a few more questions. Do you want to run the agent as a service? I did not. I want to start it and stop it manually when I'm going to use it. And I could configure auto log on and I just, I set that to the default of no as well. Um, after you've got everything configured, then you can run it. And it's going to look like, like it looks here in the screenshot. It's going to finish up uh, starting for jobs. And we're actually going to see that in the next demo here, which is, let's see, here we are. Um, I hope I shut it down. I did. Okay. But if we uh, kind of zoom in here a little bit and just type run, it's a .cmd on Windows, so it'll it's an executable, and it just it's connecting and you know it's scanned to make sure that it was up to date. It connected to the server, and then it'll go listing for jobs as soon as that connection is complete. So there we are, um, and that's great you know great big fancy schmancy demo right. The good stuff's coming, I promise. This isn't bad, but there's better stuff coming. Um, and finally, we get to uh, to pipelines. So Azure pipelines are kind of cool. Um, there's all sorts of tools out there that has been out there before Azure came up with uh, this kind of automation and pipeline thinking. And they're also cool. I'm just just straight up. Um, it's just a neat way to uh, to look at this. And we're going to walk through the uh, configuration of this uh, step by step. And what we see is in that menu we were just looking at, we're focusing on repos and pipelines. You want to click on pipelines and then click new and then click a new build pipeline. Now I want to pause here and, and just let you know if you're using Azure DevOps right now, um, you're going to be using it a little differently than the way I am. The, the reason that I'm going through this this way is if I figure if I can get you into a pipeline, 
then, you know, from zero into a pipeline, that's enough. And in fact, I know it's a lot because I help customers do this. And this is exactly how we start. Later, we go into things like artifacts and automated tests and stuff like that. But we start with exactly what I'm sharing with you here. And that's why I'm, I'm sharing this with you. I want to get you from uh, perhaps no source control, which I still encounter in 2020. Um, and, and because people don't know how to use it, not everybody does. There was a time when I didn't know how to use source control. And it was a long, long time ago, but I had to learn as well. Don't be intimidated by that. Everybody, I believe, is doing the best that they can. So um, I, when I go help people, and I love helping people, I just try to get them up to this point to start with. And as you can see, we're going to do this in a, a, you know, a little more than an hour. And if we, we can get you to here, then from here, we can take you on to the more advanced topics of artifacts and test plans and the whole nine yards. But you can actually... Uh, manually do those steps where you do deployments and you do testing, but you have to do it in a more manual way than is typical in engines like Azure DevOps. And then, like I said, there's other engines out there as well. I'm not as familiar with those other engines, but I've worked with teams that are, and um, I believe you could probably do exactly what I'm about to do here um, in this less than optimal way, kind of just getting started way in those engines as well. So I could be wrong, but um, because I don't know uh, those other engines as well. Once you once you click on a new build pipeline, it uh, actually um, asks you where is your code, and you have to kind of answer. It seems like the same question twice. It's first going to ask you, you know, where's your code? I'm in Team Foundation version control, and it's asking me for a source, and here it is, you know, selecting. Team Foundation version control again. Um, but after I've got this set up and my server path defined and everything, I can click continue and I can select a template or just build a nice empty job here. Um, I'm going to go with an empty job. And now it starts asking me about that agent pool stuff. How are you going to run the job? You need an agent to run these pipelines. So how are you going to do it? Where is your agent? And I am in the default uh, pool, agent pool. And that's the one that's uh, configured right now and running on my uh, VM right now. After um, I start setting up some variables in here and the, the one variable uh, password PWD var, I, I set that up and I named, I made sure that it was configured as sensitive because I don't want to share my password with you. I trust you except with my passwords. Other than that, we're cool, I hope. But um, yeah, so I definitely want to be able to, uh, to configure um, an, an agent as part of this job, part of this pipeline. These go together. All of the agents, all of the pipelines need that agent information. And when I'm configuring it, um, you know, I, I want to get to the spot where I can now build and deploy SSIS. Now, if you played with SSIS or uh, Azure DevOps and SSIS more than about a year ago, you didn't see what I see here. Um, there, there were a lot of, uh, I say a lot, there was a handful at least of, um, of people who had built these custom uh, tasks out there for Azure DevOps, and they were trying to solve this problem. The versions that I'm sharing with you today were actually built by the SSIS team. Um, I don't know if that's an accurate screenshot of it or not, but um, th these were new as of about the end of October, beginning of November 2019, uh, build and deploy. They've since updated them. And just last week, they uh, released a, um, a, a local version of these. And you can do command line, um, uh, you know, if you install the local code, you can do command line versions of this. And I absolutely love that. Um, you can read more about that out at the SSIS blog. And if you can't find that, email me. Uh, they moved it um, about a year ago as well. And I'd be happy to share it with you. But these tasks, uh, the new build and the new deploy task, um, the way you get to those is you click on the add tasks and then search for SSIS. <laughs> You're going to see more there today than I have on the screen. Um, 
but if I add an SSIS build task, I just configure it. It's a it's not as uh, as intense as the deploy, um, but if you just uh, tell it where you know where you're going, of course you give it a name, and tell it the path you're going to use, and then it uses these internal variables here. These are old TFS variables. Um, build artifact staging directory and once you've got that good configured then you can go do that same search again for ssis and pull in a deploy task just click that add button and it adds it to your pipelines executables there your um your your uh well your your pipelines uh, artifact and you can see the it's a little more configuration here um we're still using that that output that was built it was put into the build artifact staging directory but an SSIS package um, actually generates what's called an ISPAC file. Uh, an ISPAC file is a, um, it's really a zip file. If you have 7-zip or some WinZip or something like that installed uh, on your machine, you can open that artifact, uh, that uh, archive rather, and you can see inside of there the packages and a few deployment artifacts that MS Build uses. Um, and if you don't, you can just rename the ISPAC file extension to zip and Windows Explorer will show you those things. Just be sure to put it back before you try to deploy it. Um, you can do deployments to SSIS DB. Now this is the SSIS catalog. If you're not familiar with the SSIS catalog, it is a framework that Microsoft built to help manage the execution, um, deployment, configuration and logging for SSIS packages in the enterprise. And it came out around 2012 and um, the, it was great and still is, it's, it's still a, a great engine. In fact, there's a version of it that runs in Azure Data Factory and what we call the Azure SSIS integration runtime. So you can have essentially an SSIS catalog in the cloud and you can execute packages from there as well. In fact, this demo does that. So you can see here, this is deploying. Uh, this is an Azure SQL uh, database here, svademo.database.windows.net. And it's uh, destination path. I, I was uh, delivering this to the past summit um, last year. And uh, SQL Server authentication is what you use for that as my administrator. And there's that password I didn't want to share with you earlier. I want to go ahead and overwrite it if it exists. If there's an error, I don't want to keep going. I want to stop, but I love that fault tolerance setting, right? I can say it's if this one fails, this pipeline just keep going. There's another one out there, and you can just pick that one up and you know and and do what you need to do. <clears throat> and we can see um, an example of that of executing this build. If I um, if I pop up here to Azure DevOps and Let's see, let's go to the pipelines here and take a look. Um, you can see I've got four pipelines out here. I'm gonna start with this one numbered zero because I'm an engineer and we number things at zero. Um, if I go to the editor here, we can see how this, uh, this begins to get built, at least the pieces we just talked about. Uh, we can see a couple of things here. We'll first pop over to variables and then we'll, we'll make our way back. Uh, to this and let's see we have three children at home who are uh, using the internet here for remote school so sometimes the junior engineers suck up all the bandwidth here but we're definitely loading I've, I've noticed too when I present um, it's not in its happy place I'm going to give it about two more seconds and then click refresh all right it heard me and it decided okay I'm going to go do what Andy said so let's look at variables first, because that's what we looked at in the um, on the slides here. There's that uh, PWD for password bar, PWD bar, some other um, variables that are in here that we can turn on. System debug, if you turn that on, um, set that to true, it'll add a bunch of what I lovingly call purple text. Um, it's probably closer to magenta, but when I was a kid, we could only afford the eight crayon Crayola box. So it's purple. Um, and we would, you know, you could see all that and it easily doubles the amount of information flowing by in the screen. I absolutely love these little screens that we're going to see here in just a minute, but um, we're not going to turn that on. 
I rarely use that. I do use it sometimes for troubleshooting because sometimes I've done something dumb and sometimes there's work going on uh, under, you know, behind the scenes under the hood and something squirrely is happening. That happened to me um, today. In fact, I do a lot of uh, live streaming. I do about one a day now. I'm uh, Andy and I am a streamer. Yeah. So um, you can catch me over at twitch.tv slash Andy Leonard if you want to know more about that. Or follow me on Twitter. I'll usually announce when I'm doing it. Andy Leonard on Twitter and, and stuff like that. But I, fa I get on uh, Twitch and LinkedIn Live and YouTube and Facebook. And I just fall on my face over and over and over again. <laughs> but um, sometimes things will just go right. And when they do, I get nervous. Um, but there we are with uh, password bar. Um, we're going to look at triggers a little bit later, but that's really it. Other than that, and then task, you can see here's, I named my uh, pipeline. There's the name of it. There's where I configure the agent pool. And that's really all we're going to talk about here in the, um, in the uh, introductory. Here's all that configuration stuff that you saw on the slides. Where's, where's your stuff? And, you know, how, how's this going to work? You know, what's your display name of the actual agent job? You're going to see, um, you're going to see this name pop up. And how I got to this is I actually, and I'll click plus here and show you, this is if I want to add one saying, hey, you want to add a task? And there is a boatload of tasks. This is being updated all the time. So if I type SSIS, I just want to show you uh, what's out here. You can see this is the official build task. It says uh, for build and then deploy. Um, you can see I'm using the older versions. They still work. Uh, they do. But we're just going to go with the one we've got configured here. And, um, you know, and, and really this is it. Just what you saw on the slide, then deploy. It's going to actually deploy it. Now, we're going to be able to prove it did a deploy here in just a minute. Um, oh, Katie pop, Katie said this a while ago. You was born in Richmond and lived in Farmville the first year of your life. Wow. All roads, Katie, all roads lead to Farmville, Virginia. I'm not making this up. I was also born in Richmond, and I've lived here. I've lived around here most of my life. I lived in Jacksonville for a bit. That's pretty cool. Um, Craig also uh, put up the short link for the uh, job posting form. Hey, if you have a, a job uh, that you're looking for people, uh, there's a lot of people still hiring right now. I mean, it's a little surprising, but uh, please hit that link and post that job. Um, also, um, while we're kind of semi talking about the job market here, I just want to stop and make you aware, and I hope this is okay, and if it's not, I apologize, but if you go to Andy Leonard. Um, dot blog slash lost underscore job. If you've lost your job due to the pandemic, I offer a collection of classes on Azure Data Factory and SSIS, and I will let you attend for free. Um, I, I, I make good money delivering these classes for people who pay me to do it. But if you've lost your job, just pop into that, um, and I will type that into the uh, messages uh, here if that's okay. And if it's not okay, stop me now. Somebody yell at me one of the moderators. <laughs> I just want to make sure that um, you know you can attend these for uh, for, for free. Uh, if, you know, underscore lost job. There we go. Okay, Craig said good. Because I was ready to hit okay. Sorry, I'll shut that down. But yeah, go, go check that out and um, put your name and your email in there and I'll email you back to kind of the, the, the deal on that. Um, but here we are doing the deploy. Now, I want to. I'm going to pop in here for just a minute. This is uh, Microsoft um, S SQL Server Management Studio (SSMS), and I'm connected to that catalog in the cloud right now. And so, if I, if I um, go back, if I go back over here and I click Q, it's going to ask me, you know, how, what do you want to use? And I'm not going to put any information in here. I'm just going to leave it as it is, and then not enabling system diagnostics, that'd be more purple text. I was clicking run. And when it starts to run, I want to show you the agent screen here. So now it's telling me that, oh, wow, something bad happened, but it reconnected. And it went now to build and deploy. I'll bet you while I was spinning there, there was a problem. The cans, the uh, two cans and a string between me and the um, 
and the network connection may have been gone. So it's running. And what I here's I just absolutely love this. If we click on this, we can see it running. I love these screens in here. I know, I know, I'm old. <laughs> I just do. I think this is the coolest thing ever. Um, and you see it's kind of ticking away there, updating about every second. And it's gotten down to this part. So it checked out the SSIS samples. It's building and it's deploying now. And once it gets done deploying, it'll take about a minute or so. It'll get to, it'll finish deploying out to my test instance. And we're going to go look at that and, um, and, and go see uh, how this works. And up here in the help, by the way, they mentioned another task, SSI's catalog configuration task. I haven't played with that yet, but I've got this folder on this laptop here that has about a hundred little note files in it. And the folder's named Primordial Blogs. I'm behind. I just, I need to, to get, uh, get in there and, and, and get all of that together. But it's actually uh, doing the deployment now to our server. And once it's finished, hopefully it'll come out and say, okay. And I don't know if you can hear my system sounds or not, but I'll get an email probably about 30 seconds after that. Uh, and that email will tell me the build and deploy, zero build and deploy succeeded. So it's like right now, it doesn't look like it's doing anything, but I promise you behind the scenes, there's magic happening up there in the cloud and the agent is driving it, the local agent. I love that. So I said about a minute, um, it's making me, proving me wrong here, but it's still running the deployment. I promise you it is. Um, Let's see. Come on. Come on now. If so, there was a, a years ago, I saw I'm wiggling the mouse. It's kind of a joke. Years ago, I saw um, a solution that somebody had posted in a forum about reporting services, Microsoft SQL Server reporting services. And they said that. They said if you wiggle the mouse over something, it would, it would, I, I, okay. I don't, I don't think that was accurate, but. I do that kind of as an inside joke. I'll wiggle the mouse over. So eventually here, it's going to finish the deployment and it's going to be pretty happy. Um, I'd love to show you that. So I'm kind of stalling here talking to fill in the space. <laughs> Hope you don't mind. Um, but I, um, again, I like these screens. You can also, go, we can go back and see what we missed while we're waiting. Um, all of this build version stuff. And I know I'm not zoomed in. I'll zoom in so you can see it, but it's really exciting stuff, right? Not so much, but a lot of stuff we've been using for, for years, uh, kind of behind the scenes to, to get stuff going. So there was the finished building SSIS and it's actually a permalink to this. I don't know if that's new or not, or maybe I just never noticed. It. Um, up here to the checkout part, which is really short, checking out the samples and a permalink to that. Um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to click that. I want to right click and um, let's see if we can go there. Doesn't look like we can. What happens if we, if we just click the link? What happened? Oh, it copies it to the clipboard. Okay. We'll explore a little bit here while I'm killing time waiting for that thing to finish. That's kind of cool. Okay. So it took me right back to that run log. So we're in the same spot. Uh, probably running two of them is really, really helpful. Not so. All right, finish. Oh, that was the other thing. All right, come on down here and get to finish. I'm wiggling my mouse. Come on. All right, I don't understand why that's uh, taking so long. It may be that it's getting ready to fail. That could happen. There could be, um, it looked like it, for at least a while there, I had a network blip we saw before, um, agent connect error. Um, so I don't know. Not sure what's going on here, but we'll let this uh, cook. And we're going to go back over here and talk about uh, some uh, yet a bonus piece. Yes, there's a bonus, but wait, there's more or there's one more thing. I love Columbo. And I think Steve Jobs did that too. I'm dating myself, aren't I? Okay. So we're going to look at doing what the cool kids get to do. The people who develop JavaScript and Node. You work with JSON a lot. My friend Kevin Hazard calls JSON hipster XML. I got to agree with Kevin. I think he's got a point, but if he wears a loose fitting hat, no one notices. Kidding. Kidding. Kevin's my brother from another mother. I want to be able to do the same thing. I've wanted this forever since back in 2007 when I was 
trying to check in code and do that. And I found ways to do it. It was not pretty, but it worked. Um, now we've got uh, some options here. We can actually do this inside of um, inside of Azure DevOps. So when we check in the code, we can um, we can run uh, test executions here. I've got a little framework here that executes SSIS um, for me. So I'm going to talk about that for just a minute while we're talking about it. And then I'm going to use PowerShell to um, to test the results of that execution. So as we're walking through here, uh, just a little bit about the framework community edition. This, if you want to know more about this, ask me, but um, it's free and it's open source. So I'll share that much with you um, right now. But if you right click an SSIS package in a catalog and click execute, it'll open up this window, execute package, and then you can just script it. And when you script it, you end up with some scripts that looks like this. Now this is as old as software is. This is really a three-step process. It creates an intent to execute. The execution ID is output from that stored procedure. And this is um, an SSIS DB stored procedure here. Then it configures the intent. There's the execution ID being passed into uh, one configuration call. Usually there's more than one here, but there's at least, uh, you, usually there's at least one. Um, and then you start the execution. So create the intent, configure the intent, and then execute the intent. That's That's been around forever. And I won't go into all of the reasons why I got really excited when I saw this, but the short version is I wanted to be able to find a way to be running an SSIS package in the catalog in, you know, in this location. And I wanted to be able to run, say, another package from another location. And that's not native. Okay, It turns out that's a little tricky. But when I saw this, when I scripted this, my locations are governed by two, um, you know, two hierarchical structures here, the folder name and the project name. I can execute any package in the same SSIS project that's deployed to the same folder. I can do that all day long using a built-in task called the execute package task. But what if I wanted to run one in another folder in another project? Then it got tricky. So when I saw this, I was like, hey, I can put a wrapper proc around that. And that's exactly what I did. And I'll just pass in these as parameters. And that's exactly uh, you know how I set it all up. So it would do that. And that's what we're going to do. We're actually going to run this um, using that, that framework that holds that metadata. And I do it with PowerShell. I add a couple PowerShell tasks, one to uh, run the package using the SSIS framework, and then another to test it. And this is what it looks like in PowerShell here. This is a piece of the PowerShell. Um, and it, there's even a sleep in here for 15 seconds to give it a little bit of time to slow down. Um, I see a question here from um, Mark uh, Antoine Hebert. Did I say that right? I hope so. Um, I'm working as a contractor and I created a pipeline for an ISS web app and the source code is from GitHub. Uh, the problem is I did not find a way to connect to it without a credential. Is there a solution like using an SSH? And if so, how? That's a fantastic question, Mark. Unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I'll bet you somebody does and it may even be in this talk. Somebody may he be here that um, that may be able to help us with that answer. Use it sounds like the problem you're trying to solve is connecting to GitHub, either without a credential or maybe how to store the credential uh, in a secure way. Um, I am not sure though, and I'm sorry that I'm I don't know the answer to that. Um, what I can do is I can dig around. I'll have my email address at the very end, and Mark, if you will email me. Um, I know people who are experts at this stuff and I'll get in a conversation with them and I'm a, a Microsoft MVP as well. Um, and if I, I, I know I can find someone who can answer your question, the right way to do this, the best way to do it. Maybe there's a couple ways and there's some, you know, disadvantages and advantages, but if you'll do that, I'll, I'll have my email up and remind me of the question. I will, I will find you an answer. Promise. Um, the, uh, 
the next steps that we want to do here for triggering is I'm going to enable CI. There's actually a checkbox that's labeled enable CI on a copy of that deployed to test. I've added those two PowerShells to that pipeline and I've changed the name of it from zero to one. Um, then I'm going to configure a deploy to production pipeline and then I'm going to enable um, deploying to the production uh, trigger. There's going to be a trigger there. So it's going to actually execute it on this step. Along the way here, if anything fails, then it's, it's going to stop in the middle of that process. That's the way this is defined. So if we walk through kind of how to do this, um, I, I, if I just click on the triggers here and I click enable uh, continuous integration, that's it. I do that on that first pipeline, whenever I check in the code, it's going to fire this pipeline. And then I can chain the pipelines together um, by um, going to say my, you know, my next uh, two, and I can click on the, um, I can click on triggers there and there's a build completion down here. <clears throat> so on this last step, the deploy to production, I'm actually saying, if the, if the pipeline named deploy to test succeeds, then go ahead and trigger this one. And I'm going to do that twice. I'm chaining these three together. Um, so when I do my check-in, it, it's just automatic. It's just like the cool kids doing JavaScript and, and doing Node and all of that kind of development. Now I get to play with, uh, with SSIS and I absolutely need, uh, love that. I needed that functionality. As I shared with you, I built some ugly ways to do it. And yep, this failed. And it failed to deploy because, not sure, error deployed. Um, there may be some more, here. oh, here we go. The timeout expired. Well, that took, it took your time expiring. So it could be that that's a real error. I ran through the demos because I always run through my demos if I'm doing live demos, especially in Azure. Why? Say it with me. Azure changes daily. <laughs> so, um, I do that and I still sometimes run into stuff like this. Today, about half the time I did this, I ran through it twice, I, about half the time it failed. So let's go enable our stuff here and see if it succeeds in. I promise you that is um, this, this one copy is, uh, sorry, this one is a copy of that build and test. There's the build, there's the deploy, and then it's gonna run that package and then it's going to execute a test. And here's the test. I mean, it's not, it's all PowerShell. Let me zoom in here and show you. It's all PowerShell. But what I'm doing is I've got a table out there and inside of my test package, I'll show you in just a minute, we're going to truncate that table and then we're going to add one record to it. It's like an ID plus the date time. Um, so if I, if, I, um, if I disable the truncate task, then it's when it goes out there, it's not going to truncate it. It's going to add a second record and see this line right here. It's actually doing a record count. And that says if that record does not equal one. So if it's zero or two or any other number other than one, um, this fails. It writes out my error and, you know, that's how it works. It's super simple. But again, and uh, totally contrived here. Um, about executing a test suite in PowerShell. I, I consider this just one step above manual testing, but I don't mind manual testing. I've been working in SSIS for 15 years. My goodness, that's all we had back in the day. But if we go to triggers here, I just click the triggers and for SSIS samples, all I have to do is enable, um, click that enable continuous integration here. Um, and if I then save it, I'm not going to queue it, I'm just going to, you know, uh, type a message here, enable CI, and save that. So, let's see, I think I'm good. Yeah, my saving, saving queue went out. I was waiting for that to go disabled. Um, let's go back to the pipelines, and I want to make sure that my number two pipeline is set up to run on this uh, being, uh, being finished here as well. And I don't believe you're loading. I think you're just showing me a little spinny um, animated GIF there and not really loading. I don't think you're doing anything. I think that you, there we go. I think the junior engineers are having a lot of fun playing some Fortnite thingy or raid. I'm not, I'm not cool anymore. 
So I'm not going to enable continuous integration here on, on number two. Instead, I'm going to click add and it's going to give me the ability to pick a triggering build. I'm going to pick number one and then save that. And I hope the kids are actually having a big time. I, I do. I, I love them all to pieces. They're cool kids. I can't believe I had anything to do with them. They're that cool. Um, let's see, another place we can edit is just from here. I'm going to just double check the trigger on three. And there it is, deploy to production. So that's the second one, number two. All right, we are ready. Let's go back and look at pipelines again. Let's get our agent kind of set up here so we can see that, get it in a good spot. Um, I'm not going to need management studio, really. I mean, I could use it, but I don't need it. And I'm going to open up my SSIS uh, package here. I've got Team Explorer kind of floating around out here. And so I'm, I'm doing that so you can see when I right click and disable this truncate to target, I can then put in a message. Did you know it was 2020, 1020? Did you know that? How weird is that? Like 10 days ago, it was 2020, 10, 10. I posted that on Twitter and somebody replied, why didn't you share this at 5.05 a.m.? And I was like, you got me. I was up. I'm an early riser. Um, and this, I'm going to assert failure here um, on, the, on this one. Why? Because there should be two records in there because I'm not truncating. And so when I check this in, I should have saved it first. It's going to do the check in and give me a message, um, success or failure. And that's taking a little longer than it should. Okay, that worked. So let's pop over here and look and see, um, are we running that job? And you know, that's weird. It's, oh, there we go, build and deploy and test, uh, number one. There it's running. I thought it was running zero still, but it's running one. We can pop over to uh, the pipelines here. We can watch it. Uh, if we go to build and deploy and test it, we should see one running. Yep, there it is and run. And if there's the assert failure, and then we can go look at the actual job, the screen itself, maybe. Let's see if I click harder here, does that help? It looks like now I've got the little line going across here. I do not believe you. Come on. Gosh. I have a Master Sergeant 13 year old downstairs, and he says that. He says it with such passion, though. It's like, it's like an adult cursing at you. Gosh, damn. <laughs> so that's, that'll mess you up. And did we fail already? What happened? We did. So not sure why that failed. Let's try it again. Um, you can Changing SSIS is not hard, as you can see here. Um, I just moved one, one little task over and let's see you know we'll save again that checked in faster that's that makes me a little warmer let's try this again i just got an email i don't know if you heard it or not that said hey it failed um thanks for that DevOps. all right this is where it failed last time it looks like it it picked up and it's running now so we'll see how it does last. And you remember the time before it was the execute test suite is where it fails. So hopefully we'll get through this. Um, no, no, we did not deploy. Why did we not deploy? There is no available node. Okay, this is a completely different problem. So the reason it's failing to deploy is my catalog stopped. And the reason my catalog stopped, this is an integration runtime in the cloud. It's not anybody's fault, but Andy's. And let me tell you why. Um, whenever you're running a catalog, a little lesson here on Azure Data Factory, we'll go up here to monitor, we'll look at integration runtimes and we'll see this still starting. But if we click on this, I love this dashboard um, in a minute, Hopefully we'll see a node starting down here. This only has, it's gonna run two cores. There's my running requested node, zero of two. We should see one starting and there it is. This is a VM. And I don't know how much cloud stuff you've done, but when you're running a VM, you're paying money straight up. It's costing you, at least over in Azure. I don't, 
Uh, we do work in, in AWS. I don't do, I haven't done anything in Google Cloud or any of the other clouds that are out there. But we've done AWS, uh, quite a bit of work in there, and we and we use Azure most. Um, this is charging you money. So in order to prevent uh, Andy from hemorrhaging cash, uh, I create some jobs in here, and I've blogged about this at andylearner.blog, and you can see right here, it is now 4.26 p.m. my time. I had this running for the longest time, but this job runs every four hours. It's the name of the trigger every four hours, and it succeeded. It checks to see is the Azure SSIS catalog integration runtime running, and if it is, it shuts it down. This is because I'm old and I do demos and I forget to turn them off sometimes. This saves me money. It also embarrasses me a little bit when I uh, do this. And while we're here talking about it, let's just take a look at, uh, at how it does that. So IR ops, um, here's the stop Azure SSISR, because it, it, if it starts really fast, it's gonna take about five minutes. Um, this is me going and getting uh, my status. Remember, I just told you that I go check and I use the REST API to do this. Um, I go use the get status version of this. And, you know, when it's done, there there's an output. This is a web activity. And then in the if condition here, uh, under activities, I, there's my uh, statement. And I'm basically saying, go look at the output of that web activity and tell me, does it equal, go look at the, the output, you know, dot output, dot properties, dot state, all right here. And tell me if that equals started. And if it's true, if it's false, I don't do anything. If it's not started, I just stop. There's no false activities here. But if it's true, then I go up here and I use another call to the REST API to stop the integration services catalog, the Azure SSIS integration runtime. And that is exactly what happened a few minutes ago. And that's why we had this lovely discussion about how these work. And now it's running. I did that on purpose. That never happens. <laughs> so <laughs> everything worked like I wanted it to. All right, let's uh, run through. And this, by the way, is the last demo so let's again move this just a, a little bit. Yep, I did enough there to check it in. Assert, fail, three, check in. Yep, save everything. Checked in fast, that's a good sign. Let's go look at our pipelines. Let's go back to build, deploy, and build and deploy and test. See what our, our agent says it's running. So even though we can't see it yet because of something, the agent tells us, yep, it's going right now. And any minute now, maybe we need to go to pipelines and come in now. Yep, there we go. All right, here's a cert number three. And let's see how far we get this time. All right, we're already down to running the package. That's encouraging deployment succeeded then. And I don't know how, how you develop software. I could just tell you how I do. Um, I, I, I've said this already. I said fail first is how I learned uh, test-driven development. That's what it was called when I started using it. And, um, and I thought that's perfect. I fail all the time. Uh, early, early in developing software, I actually learned uh, software when I was when I was a kid from an engineer who worked on the Air Force side of the house for NASA. Um, really, really smart guy. Changed my life, and um, just uh, just really thank him for that. And uh, it's it, he shared with me early on: you need to divorce the emotion of failing away from the actual failure itself. You need to look at it as a step in the right direction. And he, he just reinforced that as he was teaching me Motorola machine code first and then basic. And when we were doing basic back then, we had Byte Magazine, B-Y-T-E, Byte Magazine. And it used to list the hex. So it, we didn't have any persistent storage. So we type hex commands for about 
45 minutes or so. And then if we did it all right, uh, everything would work. So we had a failure, but remember the name of our job. What was our job called? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Our job was named Assert Fail, number three. Why did it fail? Because there were two records found. I think it actually told us that in the message that came out. So Groovy, let's go fix that and have it succeed because this is the way software is normally <laughs> for me, I'll say for maybe you get it right the first time every time. There's like there's Teslas out there who think it up and build it and it works. I'm more of the Edison type, you know, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Edison succeeded because he was stubborn. Okay, a search success. Let's call this one one. Let's just start. Um, oh, I've got a message. Uh, Microsoft MSFTP status shows degradation of core services. My pipelines are running slow as well. Okay, thank you, David, for that. Craig said, maybe try clicking on it many times. I did that, uh, David. So great minds. We're right here, brother. All right, let's try this one more time. Let's see <laughs> if we get this going. And so let's watch. Oh, did I not do something? Oh, no, there it goes. Okay. So I didn't know if I forgot. So now it's running in the agent. We can see that. That's what just started here. And let's go to um, back over here and see if we've got another one in here. So load one new run. So it doesn't always show up, right? So let's load the new run. And that's running a search success one. Let's zoom in here and go to the job itself. Uh, that's good to know, David, that the uh, services are degraded. So that makes me feel better. Um, so that means somebody's having a really bad day. I, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of others having really bad days. So the package is running now and we um, enabled an execute SQL task that executes a truncate that table before another execute SQL task that adds that one row to it, right? So it should truncate the table first, leave us with zero rows, insert a row, leave us with one row. And so when we execute the test sweep, what we should get is success uh, because that it's all it's tested for is does it not equal one? If it does not equal one, the row count in there, then it's going to give us an error. I tried, uh, I, I was laughing at Craig's uh, message. Oh, Tony asked, what is my uh, Twitch channel? So while I'm gonna zoom out here while that's running and I will type in the, um, the answer. Slash Andy. I have to spell my name correctly, and that's that's a challenge sometimes. Uh, there I am, um, and I, I I pop on there. Uh, this week I'm actually going every every day at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, I made a commitment to do that. Okay, the test suite finished and succeeded, and what this means. And I don't know if you just saw it because it's it's so hard to see on this zoomed out screen here, but it just started. It just gave me the success and it's about to start number two. There it goes. Glad we caught that. I did that on purpose. I, you know, you know me well enough now already to know that I'm running on. On um, good faith. <laughs> and this is interesting. Oh, there it goes. There's that message. I just saw I, that. There it is. You were right, David. I, I didn't doubt you. Uh, pipelines in your region may be impacted by a live site incident. Check the status here. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to kind of watch it. It looks like it actually ran pretty quickly. My guess is the reporting uh, was playing catch up. It looks like it's uh, okay. It looks everything looks good. So it just deployed it to production. I mentioned DILM Suite in passing. That's where you can get the free and open source um, version of the uh, of the SSIS catalog that I'm using in here. Um, we should be firing three here in just a minute. There we go. Load one new run. Um, one of the other free products that's out there is called SSIS Framework Browser. If you've worked with SSIS in the catalog inside of SSMS, it's cool. You've got just about everything you need in there. Um, 
And since I've had some connects and disconnects, this could take a while. We'll just uh, let that go. But what we will find is that uh, there was not pri prior to this, there was nothing in my production uh, test DevOps folder, DevOps prod. And now it's been deployed. So there it is. There's the test SSIS project and all of this. And this is the package that it's actually running here. Again, this is free. Um, I got to get this out there. I'm in 9.5 out there, 0.9.5. But that needs to, to be, get out there pretty quickly. And let's see how we're doing. Looks like we're still running. Um, and in here, in this demo, I go and manually clean up some framework metadata. Frameworks are awesome. Uh, any kind of automation, especially metadata-driven automation, is awesome. But it creates this whole other problem, right? And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm an engineer. Um, it's, it's now you have to manage the metadata. Now, I've got some other talks about that. In fact, I did one recently. I did a stream recently, um, and I I put the um, I put it on my blog on andylunar.blog. If you want to search that, it's called Bimmel Stream. Uh, BIML business intelligence markup language. That's a way to manage the metadata piece, and it's it's a it's a code generation tool. Bemel is for SSIS. So you can learn more about that, and you can automate it as well to not only generate a bunch of SSIS packages really really quickly. Um, one of my anecdotes is I did ten and a half months of work in three and a half days, and <clears throat> The reason it took me that long is I had never even heard of the database engine called Progress. I thought the uh, the architect when she called me was mispronouncing Postgres, and it didn't matter. I didn't know enough about either of those. I'd never done Bemel against or SSIS against any of those. Um, I'm the worst salesperson ever. She hired me anyway. It took me a couple days, roughly, to figure out where the metadata is because there's no information schema which is where we get all our metadata. We need all of that to generate SSIS packages. It took me a couple of days to figure that out. It's there, it's just not in information schema. All right, um, I don't know if you can hear the dings in the background. We just finished up and succeeded that last build. If we go look at pipelines here, we can see that it ran them in uh, this order. It's kind of the last first here. So it's showing me that, and, and this was on check-in. That's what I love about this, right? It, I checked in the code and I was hands off. All I was doing was watching little boxes and consoles in there, I, which I love watching. But it built it, deployed it uh, to my test instance and then tested it. it. That all succeeded. Remember the first time we did that, it failed by design this time. <laughs> and then we deployed to production, which is uh, just in this case, it's it's just another folder on the same catalog, but, and I would never do this automated. I, I, while well, I say that, I'd love to get to the spot where I had the confidence to deploy to actual production uh, automated, but there would be a lot of tests, a lot of tests in there. And I, even then it would probably take me a long time before I felt confident enough to deploy. Now I could bump it up through the stack. Um, I've got a, a, a blog post about how many um, life cycle management tiers I recommend uh, for SSIS and the number's four. I recommend four. A short version, you got to have a place where you develop it. And I want the developers to actually promote the code to an environment where they can then uh, test it. It's a different environment. Perfect. If it's perfect, there's like a firewall between that test environment and dev so that if they forget connection managers, and I, I forget connection manager updates, you forget to parameterize them and stuff. You don't want it to re be able to reach the dev environment. So it will fail when it tries. And you want to get all of that worked out. The um, the fourth environment, I went one, two, I'm skipping to four, is a production environment. I want a DBA doing that deployment. I don't want developers even in that environment. And if so, I want them to have very, very, very minimal permissions in, in that environment, read only stuff. Um, the other, but there's a trick there, right? I don't want the DBA deploying to production. I don't want that deployment to be the first time the DBA has done the deployment. So I want number three, a pre-production environment, call it whatever you want, um, QA, UAT, whatever. Uh, each time the deployment's done, the Pareto principle applies. You find about 80% of the bugs 
if you do the math on that, you're down less than 1%. You're like 0.8% of the bugs when you go to production. That's, that's not satisfactory to some places, some enterprises that run under regulations. Um, for a, a few years, I managed a team that grew to 40 ETL developers when I worked at Unisys. And we were doing state Medicaid loads. It was, that was a, a lot, you know, a lot there that was complicated. We ended up with six application lifecycle tiers and our number was way, way down. <laughs> 20% of 0.8% and then 20% of that. So, yeah, and it was about right. It, it bore out as we did the math uh, on that. But uh, even manually testing it, we wanted, and we didn't have anything like this. We had something kind of kludged together with uh, thumbtacks and uh, chewing gum and duct tape. But we did the best we could with what we had. And I know for a fact, Every software developer I know is doing the exact same thing. So um, don't despise that, right? Don't despise little beginnings. Do what you know and then keep learning. You're here. I'm preaching to the choir. But um, that's, you know, that's kind of combining these agents plus Azure DevOps um, to do something that was really, really hard before. Absolutely love that we can do this now here. That brings me to the end of my uh, my presentation here. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll stick around till y'all run me off. If you'd like to learn more about me, and there's some personal stuff on here too, uh, go to andyleonard.blog slash learn dash more. And if I can help in any way, here's my email address. And I'll just leave this sitting up here for the next little bit. While I thank profusely um, the the moderators who stuck in here with me, uh, through through all this, I really appreciate y'all, and um, and thank you, the people who attended, for for hanging in here with me. Thanks a bunch. Oh, thank you for that. I believe that is the end of all things open programming, unless I missed something on the schedule. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Katie, and thanks, Craig. Appreciate oh. y'all.